Uh, my name is Gonzalo Ramos. I am not Steven Drucker. He unfortunately couldn't be here today, but uh, here's to Steve. Um, I'll be uh, facilitating this discussion. We have three wonderful presentations that thread through uh, different aspects of intelligibility, transparency, and debuggability of machine learning systems. Um, we're going to structure the session uh, with three presentations, and then at the end we'll have a panel discussion for you to participate and interact, but feel free also to ask questions uh, at the end of each presentation. We'll have enough time for maybe a few. Uh, I'll tell you when to stop, uh, if there are too many. Uh, but other than that, I hope that everybody, everybody has a great time and, uh, and a lot of ideas get generated in the meantime. So we're going to start the uh, sessions uh, with Dan Weld. Uh, he is a professor at the University of Washington and the Allen Institute for Artificial Intelligence. He's going to talk about intelligibility uh, in something that I think is very interesting in terms of uh, uh, using the metric of teams being productive, not just a machine learning system or model to be super accurate. It's about more a human-centric way of, of thinking about the whole theme. So Dan, uh, if you may, come to the podium. Um, can everybody hear me? Great. And very good. Okay, great. Um, uh, thanks so much. Uh, excited to uh, excited to be here, and I want to talk about sort of the key problem was we make AI systems more and more complicated as they become much harder to understand. And partly that's because um, we're using complex nonlinear models and. Um, and also because we're training on, on uh, these very large, large data sets. And I think this leads to two key questions. One is, when can we trust the AI system? And the other one is, um, how can we adjust it when it's not doing what we want? So um, I think intelligibility of our AI is what we're really after. Um, so let me start by trying to define it. First of all, I think of it as a relative notion. So we say a model, an AI system is intelligible to the extent that a human can um, predict how a change to the model's inputs is going to affect the change of the output. So simula simulatability maybe is not necessary, but this ability to answer counterfactuals I think is super important. Um, I think we know an intelligible model when we see it. So um, decision trees, if they're based on semantically meaningful primitives and are relatively small, um, are, are intelligible. But as the tree gets big, um, then, then it's not. Um, and these linear models, again, if they're over semantically meaningful primitives, are intelligible. Um, the problem is that they don't often perform quite as well as the more complex nonlinear models. And so people eschew them. Um, a third model that I think is especially exciting are these general, um, generalized additive models where you can have shaping functions on otherwise linear components, and we can also bring in limited kinds of nonlinearity. I think Rich Caruana is going to be talking about this, so um, I, I'm going to skip that part. So that's what I mean by intelligibility, and I think that there's seven reasons why intelligibility is really, really important in our AI systems. Um, uh, Gagan Banzal and I wrote, have a CACM paper that came out a few months ago, and um, we go into those in detail. I'm just going to touch on a few of them. Um, so the first one is, um, when you design your AI system, it's very hard to figure out what the objective function should be, and oftentimes we end up optimizing the wrong thing. This is both in machine learning and um, in planning-based systems. So let me give one example about personal assistance. Um, my colleague Oren Etzioni and I built um, uh, a personal assistant uh, many years ago. Um, that in contrast to many of the script-based systems we see with Alexa and Cortana and so on, used a planner to put together actions to achieve the goal that, um, that the user specified. Um, in fact, I was uh, very, very proud that we were able to prove a soundness theorem that this machine could never make mistakes. So that's, that's awesome. Uh, why do you need intelligibility if you've proven that the thing is not going to make mistakes? Um, well, here's one example that came up. Um, you can ask the system, you know, how much of my disk storage am I using for my photo collection? Um, and the system came back and it said, none. I just executed RM star, and now I know you're using none. So this really is answering the question, right? In fact, it's a beautifully simple plan that meant it didn't have to go through and count all the different subdirectories. Um, 
uh, but it wasn't really what I intended. So on the one hand, you could say, well, that's really stupid. I should have put in another subgoal saying don't delete um, any of my files. Um, but the problem is that there's an infinite number of these subgoals. In fact, this is um, an aspect of the qualification uh, problem that uh, McCarthy and Hayes uh, identified many, many years ago. Um, um, another reason why intelligibility is important um, is because your AI system may be using an incorrect, uh, maybe missing a key feature. Um, and I love talking about this, but actually Rich Caruana is, I think, going to talk about it more, so I'll skip it. Um, a third reason that's very dear to me is um, that intelligibility facilitates user control. Um, and here is an example from the newsfeed application in Android. You can't really see it, so I'll blow up at the bottom. They've got some commands, and it's really saying, you know, why did I get this story? Well, here are the reasons I got the story. And furthermore, they're taking those reasons and they're turning them into commands. I can say, no, I don't want Netflix, or no, I don't want stories from The Hollywood Reporter. So those are part of the reason why you got the story, and it's facilitating a command to the user. Um, We've adopted this principle into a new system called Semantic Sanity that we've built at the Allen Institute for AI. Encourage you guys to, uh, to try it out. Um, it's publicly, uh, publicly available and it's free. So what is it? It uh, goes over archive and it gives you um, all of the research papers it thinks you're interested in and you can give it feedback so that it very, very quickly learns what you're interested in. In fact, this morning, um, I went there to my human-centered AI feed and found this cool paper, which I haven't had a chance to read yet, but um, is, is on my, my stack to read. So I find that this thing is indispensable as a way um, of keeping up with, uh, with the literature because there's so much stuff gets published every day. Um, and I'd like to point out that we've got this sort of traditional kinds of commands. You can say, yes, I like this paper. No, I don't like this paper. And uh, we can learn uh, a complex neural model based on paper embeddings that will predict um, which papers you're likely to, to like. But um, over here on the, on the bottom right, we've got something that works internally and is going to be a part of the publicly available um, thing next week. And that is, you know, why did, why did you suggest this paper? Um, I'll come back a little bit later and say how we built it, but notice that it gives these actionable explanations. So I can go in and say, well, actually, explanations are right, and um, uh, intelligible machine learning is right, but actually, I don't really care very much about autonomous cars, so I can just click on that, um, and um, it will adjust the feed based on the explanation, not on this specific paper, because, in fact, I did like the paper. Um, sort of continuing this thing, um, we're seeing increasingly um, human AI teams. And the, the dream is that um, we're going to be able to go and only have errors that both the human would make and the AI system would make, and so we can have higher performance. That's what, that's what we're after, and intelligibility should hopefully bring us to this dream much more quickly. Of course, we see um, lots of AI systems out there that, that get updated, and, and they actually don't lead to better teamwork. In fact, um, they, they uh, deal with these AI-specific um, errors and get into serious trouble. Um, so this is sort of trying to study this problem. Um, we've been viewing a paradigm called um, uh, uh, AI advised human decision making. It's not really the best buzzword, but it's the best we came up with. And the, the dream again is if we improve the accuracy of the AI, then the improved decisions come out where the human hopefully knows when to trust the AI and when not to. Um, so um, looking at this update problem, I'd like to talk for a minute about some work by Agaga and Benzal done with um, a bunch of collaborators here at Microsoft Research as well as Walter Lisecki at, at Michigan. Came out as AAAI paper this last year. So again, the dream is when we update the AI system, we're going to improve the overall output of the human AI team. Um, and the danger is actually what might happen is at that time of update, even though the AI is more accurate, it breaks the mental model the human has. Um, and as a result, it leads to, to reduced team performance until eventually um, the human understands what the AI is doing and then presumably is able to get back up to a, to a high spot. Um, so one question is, 
are these kinds of incompatible updates common? Because they happen all over the place. Your Tesla autopilot updates, your Microsoft um, focused inbox updates. Um, are these updates tend to be, are, are, you know, they're usually trained on, on more training data. Does that lead to compatible um, uh, classifier or does that lead to an AI system which is doing things very, very differently? And here you see some experiments and you can see in all cases, training on the larger training set led to a more accurate um, uh, machine learning system. But much of the time, it made very, very different mistakes, it made mistakes where the old system previously had the right answer. So if the human was relying on that model, um, they could get into trouble. Um, uh, and uh, we did some, uh, some human subject experiments and showed, indeed, people do learn models of how the AI system uh, works. And if you have an incompatible update, um, then the overall team performance goes down, as you might, might expect. Um, and then finally, um, as part of this AAAI 19 paper, we um, introduce a regularization um, technique that tries to maintain compatibility. Um, and there's a number of different ways of, of doing it. I refer you to the paper, but actually you can get much improved compatibility um, with really no, no loss in accuracy in many, many cases. Okay, so that's human AI team. Excuse me as I try to move through this stuff quickly. Hopefully lead me to a good discussion afterwards. Um, the, the last um, method, I, reason I wanna talk about is um, for, for intelligibility is that you get different distributions in the training set and test set. In fact, oftentimes there's feedback loops which cause um, uh, the presence of an AI system to lead to a different distribution of, um, of systems. Um, so, we see with filter bubbles and, and other things, um, uh, we get feedback from the human in the loop system and we can lead to, to, uh, to different, uh, different distributions and that can lead to poor performance. Um, so uh, I don't mean to pick on Microsoft because lots of people are, are heralding uh, the performance of their AI systems. Um, uh, this was specifically referring to a natural language challenge problem called Squad. Um, where we're doing question answering, and you know, here the question is, who asked Luther to disavow his writings? Um, does anybody have the answer? Can you read the Wikipedia page? Anybody? Okay, so it was Pope Leo X, um, and uh, you know, it's a hard problem. The fact that the AI system can actually answer that question correctly is pretty super impressive to me. Um, and it does really, really well. So this Microsoft research team, um, uh, I think actually now this people, another, another system does even better, but did better than, than human performance, at least mechanical Turk performance at 82.5% um, at um, exact match accuracy. So that's really cool. On the other hand, if you take the exact same system and you give it a much simpler question, um, saying, you know, which of these two students um, uh, you know, didn't like science when, when it says right there, Alice likes chemistry, um, the, the LSTM model comes back and it says, well, you know, I think it was Alice. It's like such an easy question, and yet it's from a different distribution. You might think the AI system should be able to do really well on, you know, on simple questions as well as the hard questions, but the answer is, um, is no, it's not. So, um, just being able to do well on the test set is not necessarily enough to trust the system when we deploy it. Um, so uh, to try to address this problem, um, uh, Sherry Wu, co-advised by Marco Ribeiro here and Jeff Hare at UW, um, has built a system to try to facilitate error analysis of AI systems, um, specifically looking at natural language question answering um, as, one, as one example. Um, and if you look at the state of the art, what do people actually do in, um, in ACL um, and NACL conferences? Well, to try to understand, they understand it's important to figure out why their model's not being perfect, but what they typically do is choose 100 examples and then group them into um, a bunch of classes and sort of say, well, it looks like 32% of the errors um, are due to you know, the parser making a mistake. And there's a bunch of problems with this. First of all, the error groups are subjective, so if you try to reproduce that analysis later, you get very, very different groups. Secondly, we're only choosing 50 to 100 examples. That's really not gonna be giving us very much confidence that we've identified the true size of these different errors. More importantly, we're focusing exclusively on the errors, 
it may turn out that we identify a case where the parser um, is going on where um, actually in most cases the system does well even when the parser gets a mistake. Um, but, it, but the distribution is different if you look just at the error case instead of the whole case. Um, and then finally, there's no test on the true cause, whether that really is the cause of, the underlying cause of the error. Um, so erudite tends to solve all of these different things. So first of all, trying to make these hypotheses reproducible with a domain-specific language, um, making it so you can scale up and use a much larger sample, um, test not just on the errors but also on the correct instances, um, and finally, to, to test via counterfactual analysis. Um, uh, there's an awful lot of stuff here, so I'm going to skip most of it, but this gives you um, a hint of the UI, and the system is open sourced, um, so I encourage you guys, uh, if any of you do NLP, to look at it. On the upper left, you see at a quick glance how well your model's doing. In the lower right, you can browse through examples in the development set. Um, in the upper right, we've got a little interactive panel where there's a domain-specific language that allows you to find new attributes and groups. In the lower left, we can see the distribution um, statistics over these attributes as defined in the domain-specific language. Too much for you guys to grab all this stuff. And I won't go through the details, but using this tool, we can go through and expect the errors, define these new attributes, discover groups where the errors seem to be ubiquitous, um, and we can hypothesize that really is the cause of the error. Um, and that's typically what a, a traditional error analysis um, does. The thing that's nice is because we're defining these groups in the domain-specific language, we can save them out and they can be reproduced and other people can try those same groups on their model as well. But I think the really interesting thing is what comes next. And that is um, what we'd like to do is test to make sure that that really did cause the error. Um, so in this case, we might have decided incorrect preprocessing is what's really leading to the error. So the, um, but does that mean that if we do the preprocessing better, that that fixes the error? Um, this is just one hypothesis, and I haven't gone through how we might have come up with this hypothesis, but except that we found an example where um, there was a date range and the, the hyphen between, and the, there were no spaces, and that caused the system to tokenize wrong. And that's what seems to be causing an error in a number of cases. Um, what we can do is, go through and edit our example, and then see whether or not the system gets it right. And um, in this case, it does get it right. So this seems to be encouraging. But notice that we're actually testing um, our hypothesis about the cause of the errors. And what's especially interesting is that Erudite allows you to automate these tests and test them on a large number of examples. So there's um, an ability to define rules. So here what we're doing is making that edit where we're adding in an extra space and we're gonna run that over all of, um, all of the examples in our, in our data set. And what do we see? We see that actually fixing the tokenization problem only cause the system to get the right answer 31% of the time. So most of the time, the system still made an error. So this tokenization is not explaining what's going on with our AI system. Um, I went through that very, very quickly. I, take, I suggest if you're interested, you take a look at the, um, uh, at the ACL paper. Um, Okay, so what I've done is gone through um, some of these reasons, the ones that I find most interesting about why intelligibility is important. Um, but, uh, and here's what I would say. If you're out there building an AI system, first question you should ask is, is it intelligible? Is it built on one of these intelligible models like the one that Rich Caruana is gonna say? If so, go for it, use it directly. By all means, you should be preferring to do that. But there's a really hard question. What if that doesn't work for you? In particular, what if you need um, more complicated nonlinear interactions? Or most importantly, what if the vocabulary you're using um, isn't semantically meaningful and so um, you can't really understand what's going on um, for example, if you're trying to do image, image recognition, the underlying features are pixel values, but an explanation that says, you know, I think it's a bird because, you know, pixel 512 by 37 is green, that's, um, that's not a meaningful answer. Um, so in 
this case where we need to use a, an unintelligible, maybe a deep neural model, really what we need to do is we need to map to a simpler model, which is going to be an approximation, explanatory approximation. And we need to map over the explanations, and we also need to map over the controls, and then the user can interact with this simpler model. There's problems with this with this approach because any time you do an approximation, you're not necessarily telling the truth about what's really going on in the AI, but I don't think that there's any choice if, you're forced, if you have to use that unintelligible model um, to begin with. Um, so thinking about this, why would you use, um, why might the model you've chosen be unscrutable? So one reason is because it's too complex. The other one is because it's based on features that are not semantically meaningful, like pixels, say, where some hidden layer of the neural network that actually has invented its own features that are useful for classification, but we don't know what those are. Um, so we want to model, do we want to map to the simpler explanatory model? And there's a couple techniques that work. So one technique that's very good um, is to simplify by currying. And that's basically, instead of trying to explain exactly everything that the doctor has about their head in terms of medical diagnosis. Let's just explain why they made um, the diagnosis of kidney failure on this particular patient. Okay, let's explain the instance, not the overall model. Um, and then the other thing is simplify by approximating. So maybe we could choose a linear model or some other scrutable model and map to that. Um, and then the other, the other thing is maybe the features are not semantically meaningful, in which case we need to map to new vocabulary. And I think that this is actually a super, super hard problem, and there's been a, a couple approaches to it, which um, I'm happy to talk uh, about. Um, I haven't figured out how to do it, but, um, but other people have some pretty cool research in this area. Um, and oftentimes you have to do both of these at the same time. Um, uh, so, actually, we have done it a little bit. So coming back to um, the, um, the paper recommendation system, um, it's based on uh, a paper embedding uh, uh, model that is, um, is trained on um, semantic scholars, corpus of 170 million scientific papers. Um, and um, we're experimenting with a number of deep neural models for the actual recommendation, and they're really quite good, but of course, these these models are not, are not scrutable. So if we want to generate an explanation, what, what can we do? We actually have these two problems. The model itself is too complicated, and the features based on these paper embeddings are too complicated. Um, so what we do is um, we come up with an explanatory model, which um, is simply a linear classifier um, that approximates um, what our global model is doing. And then we simplify the features, so instead of using the model embeddings, we use bigrams, which are pretty easy for people to understand. Um, and then we also do this currying idea, where we generate an instance-specific explanation. So in particular, with the linear classifier, we show what the most influential features are for this particular example the user is asking about, um, not, not in general. And that's how um, the explanation systems works. Um, okay. Um, so, in conclusion, um, I'd like to argue intelligibility is really important and that there's many different reasons, but th these are the seven, I think, important distinctive reasons why you want to have intelligibility in your AI system. Um, the way you should approach fielding an AI system is first always try to use an intelligible model if you possibly can, and if you can't, you have to map to a simpler model, and, um, and there's a set of techniques for doing that. Um, uh, and in this mapping, you're going to be facing um, a simplicity fidelity trade off. So the original model is accurate, this is actually what the AI system does, but um, it's um, too hard for a person to understand. And so, how do you actually balance something that a person can understand with something that actually um, is a good approximation for what the AI system is really doing? And there's three techniques simplified by currying, by approximating, and mapping to a new vocabulary. Um, and then one thing I haven't really had much time to talk about is um, a lot of papers about explainable machine learning treat this as let's generate the best possible explanation. But I think really explanation is better thought of as a dialogue. So we really should be seeking to build interactive systems that provide an explanation but allow the user to ask follow-up questions. So how can we 
um, think about interactive explanations. Um, the, the erudite system is one way of thinking about that. And then finally, very, very important to allow um, uh, the user to test their hypotheses to see whether that's really what's going on with the AI system. Um, so that's it. Um, thank you very much. Um, I Oh, right, minimizing dissonant updates. And then uh, what I've been talking about is a result of uh, a really large number of fantastic collaborators. I focus on the work of Gagan Banzal and Sherry Wu, um, but uh, influenced by many, many people here. So, um, so thank you to them. Thank you, Dan. We have time for maybe a couple of questions when we switch speakers. Our next presenter will be Matt, but in the meantime, we have a, a microphone in the room. Um, if you want to, so let's, let's start with the path of least resistance. There was a, a person in the back there and then the gentleman here. Uh, Hi, uh, Pietro Michelucci, Human Computation Institute. Um, so Dan, uh, really appreciate the talk. It's a, it's a fascinating uh, area and I think really worthwhile and, and a difficult problem to grapple with. Um, that said, I. I do find myself wondering what B.F. Skinner would say about this. Um, so it sounds like what you're saying is that we have these opaque systems that are producing an output, and we're trying to increase transparency and intelligibility about how they arrived at those to build trust. Um, yet the approach we're taking sounds very much like the black box approach of we stimulate the black box this way, and we see what comes out on the other side. And, um, and, and so, and I understand the rationale for that approach is these are very complex systems and if we look inside, we might not really understand what's going on. On the other hand, the reason we took the behaviorist approach with humans in the first place is because we couldn't get into those squishy systems and really understand what was going on. But we've built these systems. We know what the architectures are and even if the representations that arise through learning are unintelligible at first glance. I wonder if there are methods we could apply, for example, to, um, uh, to see what these intermediate representations look like, the ones uh, that are informing the output of the system. So I think you suggested that there might be a feature layer, and if we look at those features, they don't seem semantically mappable to anything specific. On the other hand, if those are informing a highly accurate output that even exceeds a human output, there must be some semantic value to those, and maybe it's not individual, but how they're used in concert. So is there some way that we can remove this opaqueness from the black box and expose these intermediate layers uh, as a way to, to start to approach true transparency? The concern I have about the input-output model is that, um, that often in these systems, these supposedly deterministic systems that apparently behave in, uh, in non-deterministic ways is, is that if you ping, you might miss the edge cases, and those edge cases can be critical. Um, so I absolutely agree. I think that's a fantastic point, so thank you. Um, I actually think that's incredibly important. I'm not quite sure how to do it, uh, which is one of the reasons I didn't put it up there, but that's not an excuse. I should have put it up there. I think the key challenge, if, especially if you think about these neural networks, is the hidden layer is clearly learning something that's semantically meaningful, but today there's absolutely no reason why there should be a one-to-one -one correspondence between what is learning at one node in the, in the neural network and some concept that in our mind has, has a name. In particular, it might be learning all of the same things that we're learning and we have words for, but they're all sort of rotated, so there's some sort of linear combination. So each one makes no sense to us, even though it actually spans the same space as our concepts. So we need to figure out some way to train these neural networks so that uh, we can regularize again to get those the, the hidden layer so that it actually matches concepts that we know how to talk about. And um, there are people who are, who are working on things like that. I think the way that the only approach I've seen that does that is trying to build up, again, a really large supervised training um, set um, of sort of semantically meaningful concepts and textures and things like that for image recognition and then trying to do um, joint training on both the task at hand and the sort of explanatory task. So there is some cool work at, um, at UC Berkeley, Trevor Darrell's group, Lisa Hendricks' um, thesis that does this. Um, I think it's super hard to do, but absolutely very, very important direction. Thank you. We're going to just make that one question. That was a 
good one, uh, but a long one. So we're gonna we're gonna call. Uh, uh, thank Great. you, Dan. Uh, then I'm gonna try to be brief and introduce Matt. Matt Kay from the University of Michigan. He's gonna talk about uh, the subject of uncertainty and how it's a moral imperative to communicate it to people. And this is especially uh, important for people that are not machine uh, learning experts and, and so on. Matt, Great. take it away. Thanks. Uh, can you hear me? Is this working back? Yeah. Great. Uh, yeah, so I, I'm going to talk about uncertainty visualization as a moral imperative. Um, I think that uncertainty visualization is important both when we're communicating to uh, lay users out in the world and also when we're trying to understand our own models. And I'm going to try to touch on uh, both of those topics. Um, but I usually like to start talks about uncertainty um, by asking about what happens when we ignore it. Um, so here's a recommendation for how to communicate uncertainty in scientific papers. Um, a mixed design ANOVA with sex of faces with thin subjects factor and self-rated attractiveness and oral contraceptive uses between subjects factors reveal the main effect of sex of face, F of 1, 1276 equals 1372, P of less than 0, 0.00, no thanks. Um, <laughs> reasonable alternatives to this kind of thing might be something like a regression coefficient table. Uh, so here I have uh, regression coefficients with standard errors. Um, I might do something a little bit better. So here's a coefficient plot. Essentially, the same information is being communicated by these two things. But now I can easily see magnitude and precision. Um, although still, I'm missing a little bit of information. I might do something like a sampling distribution or a likelihood or a Bayesian posterior, depending on your statistical flavor. Um, on top of that, to try to get a better sense of the fidelity of the uncertainty here. But really, I want to ask the question of how easy is it to ignore the uncertainty? And then I would argue very. I can look at this number, that dot, or that dot. Um, happily take this, uh, observe that this doesn't overlap zero, publish that, don't publish that, and now we have publication bias. Uh, this is something that some statisticians like to call dichotomania, which is the unending ability of human beings to ignore uncertainty and just stick things in buckets. Um, one of my favorite examples of dichotomania, actually a lot of my favorite examples of dichotomania come from elections. Um, these are probabilistic predictions of Trump's chance of winning the 2016 presidential election. Uh, so 538 gave him a 28% chance, New York Times gave him 15%, and Huffington Post gave him a 2% chance. Um, the interesting thing is that still to this day on Twitter, uh, people get angry at 538 for this prediction, um, not only because of the result. I mean, there's other things going on here about why people are angry about that. but because they think that this is a bad prediction. But the interesting thing is that 538 publishes calibration data. When they some, say something is going to happen about a third of the time, about a third of the time it happens. And that's what you want from a probabilistic prediction. So this is actually not a bad prediction. The problem is the way it's being communicated. So let me show you something different. Um, this is a risk communication theater. The story here is I've given you a ticket to a random seat in a theater. I've published the, or I've uh, colored the seats black in proportion to Trump's chance of winning the election. If you end up in a black seat, he wins the election. Uh, if you end up in a white seat, he doesn't. I hope you'll agree with me here that you'd be a little less surprised to learn that you end up in a black seat than when I tell you there's a 28% chance and the thing actually happens. Um, and so the point that I'm trying to make here is that people are very good at ignoring uncertainty, but this is especially true when we provide bad uncertainty representations, and we don't have to. Um, so medical risk or these risk communication theaters are just examples of icon arrays. We use them in medical risk communication uh, to communicate things like uh, chances of different possible outcomes given uh, certain treatments and things like that. Uh, we call these frequency framing or discrete outcome visualizations of uncertainty. Um, and there's a broader class of these sorts of things that we can use to try to communicate uncertainty more effectively. Um, so uh, one thing you might ask here is, how would you do this with a continuous distribution? This is just a categorical distribution of two different possible outcomes. Um, that was something that I played around with a little bit uh, in my PhD. Um, so I'm going to give you an example scenario of something else. Uh, this is, we're in Seattle, so this is one bus away. It's a system in Seattle that tracks where all the buses are in real time, tries to predict when they're going to show up at your bus stop. So this is telling me the bus number 120 is going to show up 11 minutes from now. It has a six minute delay. There is an uncertainty presentation here. If you read down at the bottom, it says bus arrival estimates are based on the best available information, but actual times will vary. Um, this is maybe not that useful for me. I, we're in Seattle. I want to ask this question. Do I have time to get a coffee? This is what the system is telling me right now. Uh, sometime between now and the future, your bus is going to show up exactly 11 minutes from now. Um, well, it's just not really useful for me to try to answer that question. What I actually want is something like this. So here's a probability distribution over time to arrive at my bus. Um, there's a bit of a long tail there. Maybe it gets stuck in traffic. It could show up as early as maybe about six or seven minutes um, from now. It's most likely to show up 11 minutes from now. But this is actually not what I want either. What I actually want is something like this. 
If I show up at the bus stop eight minutes from now, there's a 90% chance the bus comes after me, um, which is the same thing as saying that I actually get on the bus. Uh, the problem is this 90% number is going to change from person to person, situation to situation. Uh, maybe I really want to make this bus because it's an important meeting, or maybe uh, I know there's some other buses coming, or it's a lunch uh, date with some friends, and it's fine if I'm a little bit late. Uh, so I can't just replace this number with that number on the basis of choosing uh, our risk tolerance arbitrarily. So what I actually want is a visual presentation that allows people to make this sort of decision on the basis of their own understanding of the situation and their own understanding of the uh, uncertainty and their own incentives. Um, and so we're going to try to build something like an icon array for this distribution. The way we're going to do that is we're going to take evenly spaced probabilities and project them back into data space and build up something called a quantile dot plot. Um, and now what you can do is the sort of uh, counting-based reasoning or, uh, around um, uncertainties that you can do with something like an icon array. So I can say something like, well, there's 20 dots here. If I get there uh, eight minutes from now, I miss two out of 20 of the hypothetical buses, or I catch 18 out of 20 of them, so I have a 90% chance of catching the bus. I can do this with arbitrary intervals down to the resolution of the dot plot. The other thing that's cool here is that humans, we can do this thing called subitizing. Um, which is just that up to about five uh, elements in a collection, you can immediately recognize how many elements there are there without having to uh, individually count them. So if I have a 20 dot dot plot and I mostly care about estimates in the tails of the distribution, uh, most of the things I'm doing, uh, I can estimate using supertizing, which is nice because it's fast and it's accurate. And that's what we found. So we've looked at the ability of people to extract uh, probabilities from different uh, visual representations, their error, um, and it is uh, generally better in uh, low density dot plots. But then there's this question on, with uncertainty visualization that always comes up, which is even if you know how to extract the probability from a visualization that you should need in order to make the decision that you want to make, do you actually know how to use that number to make that decision? So we run some other studies where we look at things like uh, we do incentivized decision-making experiments, and then we look at decision quality. And we're not going to get into the details. You can look at the paper if you're interested. The, the thing that you see is that as people use a system more um, that uses this type of presentation, they're able to learn how to use it. Uh, this is showing me the variance in the population. So even bad performers get better. If you compare it to things like density plots, they don't work nearly as well. Okay. So we have this broad class of uh, discrete outcome or frequency framing uh, visualizations of uncertainty. I'm going to give you a couple more examples of these um, to try to uh, sort of maybe stoke your creativity in thinking about how you could apply them. Um, so there are simple examples. So 538, after uh, being continually uh, lambasted for this prediction, even though it was a good one, uh, let's look at what they did in the 2018 midterms. Uh, so this is their forecast for the 2018 midterm house. Um, you'll see they're now using the, the top line thing that you notice as soon as you look at this is actually a sort of frequency framing uh, approach to communicating this uncertainty. You can still see the like, probability down here, but this is the thing that they're trying to make you focus on. This also comes up in uh, hurricane forecasting all the time. So this is the uh, dreaded cone of uncertainty. Um, it's, uh, in this case, I think a 95% uh, uh, predictive cone for the, where the center of the hurricane will be. Um, we have this thing called uh, deterministic construal errors that often come up in uncertainty communication, uh, where people will, some people will misconstrue uh, aspects of a probabilistic forecast as being aspects of uh, trying, to, trying to predict something deterministic about the outcome. So here, as you might expect, some people will uh, misconstrue this as predicting the size of the hurricane at a given time point, uh, which it isn't, right? Once it makes landfall, it starts to get smaller. Um, so one option to this is to do something like a spaghetti plot. So here I take um, draws of paths from uh, predictive distribution um, rather than trying to show you this cone. This is also nice because you get a little bit better fidelity. You can actually see that some of the paths, uh, while not very likely, do go all the way over here. Uh, there's even a couple down here, which you may or may not be able to see, depending on the, where you are in the room. Um, you can do this with model output. So here's a simple linear regression um, with a 95% confidence band. Obviously, I'm quite willing to ignore the uncertainty here. I'll just take the line. 
and assume that that's uh, what reality is. Um, I could try to mitigate against that a little bit. I could do this sort of spaghetti plot approach. So here's um, 100 draws from a uh, distribution over um, these regression fit lines. Uh, I could instead do a sort of animated approach. Um, so here uh, we call this hypothetical outcome plots. This was something that uh, Jessica Hellman introduced. She's sitting over there. Um, where you actually take draws from this distribution and then animate over them. One of the ideas here is to try to help people actually experience the uncertainty um, to try to get a better understanding of what's going on. You can also do interesting sort of estimation tasks where if you had some threshold you cared about, you could do things like count how often the line goes above or below that threshold uh, as, a, as an estimate of um, some probability that you care about. Okay. So I sort of tried to give you a whirlwind uh, tour of some uh, approaches to uh, communicating uncertainty from a sort of probabilistic perspective. I want to take a step back from that for a second. Um, so you've done a data analysis or fit some models and you want to try to communicate that to people. Uh, maybe you're writing up a paper or uh, you're writing up a report. Um, of course, this is what your data analysis looked like. Your data came in and the analysis happened and then your output came out the other side. And maybe it's a p-value or maybe it's a, uh, like an f-score or precision or recall or some other metric that you care about or maybe this is some visualizations of, of results or some predictions or what have you. Um, but your data came in, the analysis happened, and that thing came out the other side. Well, this is ob obvious, obviously a parody of a data analysis process. It actually looks something like this. You have different choices for, say, outlier removal or uh, feature engineering or data transformation or statistical models. And then uh, what you actually had was this combinatorial explosion of possible analyses you could have done. Um, this is model or specification uncertainty. And this is not necessarily probabilistic. This interacts with things like domain knowledge. Um, this interacts with things like whether or not we actually believe the definitions of the things that we're measuring correspond to the thing that we care about in the world, right? Um, this is, this is not just statistical uncertainty. Um, so one of, the, one of the ways we think about uncertainty in the uh, statistical realm is we have these two notions of, uh, and depending on who you ask, the definitions here vary, but I'm going to adopt one that I like. Uh, you have notions of epistemic and uh, aleatory uncertainty. So epistemic uncertainty is uncertainty in what we know. We might quantify that uh, in terms of things like uh, parameter uncertainty. Uh, so here, if I collected a whole bunch more data, um, my uncertainty in the slope and the intercept of this line are going to go down, and this band around the, the line is going to get narrower. As I collect more and more data, aleatory uncertainty doesn't go down. It's predictive uncertainty. So it's it, what's going to happen, uh, what do I think the distribution is here at any given x point for what a new data point would be? Okay, so that's all well and good. We have our notions of statistical uncertainty. We also have this thing called ontological uncertainty. How well does all of this crap describe reality? And that's really what we're starting to talk about here. This is not necessarily something that you can quantify, but you can try to deal with it a little bit, or not. Um, <laughs> Okay, so one way of dealing with this is uh, you do something like what in social science they'll call pre-registration and in what machine learning we might call a uh, holdout set. Uh, so you at least define what this path is, you pick a model, you pick all of those things, and then you apply it to some data that you haven't looked at before, uh, and you see what comes out the other side. Um, but this runs immediately into the problem of that old adage, no good data analysis plan actually survives the data. Um, you learn something by applying this to a holdout set. You learn something by applying it to new data, and you actually want to incorporate that somehow into your analysis and into how you communicate it and how you think about it. So the other option is, oh, sure, just communicate the combinatorial explosion of all of this stuff, <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> So here's some matrices from a paper that does that. Uh, each cell is an analysis. Um, and of course, at this point, you're essentially reduced down to, well, I have one metric that I can show you. Um, so what uh, I had this project uh, with some folks at INRIA and with, uh, including Fanny Chevalier, who I think is here. I don't know if I see her in this room, but she's here somewhere um, at the summit. 
so we had this thing called explorable multiverse analysis reports. Um, and the, the idea here, uh, so we have a web page you can go to if you want, uh, showing examples of some of these. But the idea is to get away from the sort of fixed static presentation of uh, research papers and actually allow the reader to um, interrogate your paper in ways that they might wish to. So maybe in this particular example, you're interested in different data transformations um, or statistical approaches or confidence levels. Um, you might even want to be able to animate over uh, the different possible analyses in that uh, multiverse. You'll notice here that the discussion and conclusion section are not changing as I do this. Um, so, that, so this is not a choose your own adventure, uh, what paper do I want to get out at the end? The, the idea is that you, you still write the discussion and conclusion to be robust to some of these analysis choices, um, but that you can have a conversation with it via the paper with your reader. Um, so you have another, another uh, a number of examples of this. How am I doing on time? Five minutes? OK, so I'll, I'll show two. Uh, so <laughs> so this, uh, this example is an interesting one. There was an infamous paper sort of uh, near the beginning of some of the replication crisis stuff um, where some folks were running kind of silly studies looking at things like whether or not um, uh, menstrual periods had impacts on um, voting patterns or uh, religiosity. Uh, part of the problem was that there's a lot of ways of defining what constitutes a different point in someone's menstrual cycle. Um, and as a result of this, uh, there are a lot of different ways that you could analyze this particular data set um, and make different choices about what you think um, those particular definitions should be. Um, but the original paper sort of had this uh, interaction effect that they found um, that a lot of the uh, paper conclusions and everything was written up around. Um, well, the interesting thing is that if you um, go back and say, well, what are a number of different possible reasonable ways you could have done this analysis, and then do all of those combinations, and then uh, sort of look at what they might have looked like, uh, you'll notice that that star doesn't appear very often um, <laughs> when I animate over the multiverse. So this is one way of, uh, again, trying to interrogate uh, the reliability of some effects on the basis of different ways you could have reasonably analyzed the data. Uh, the last one I'm going to show, uh, so this is a uh, Bayesian analysis of some data. It, for the purposes of the example, it doesn't matter too much um, what's, what the analysis is. Um, so one of the potential issues with a Bayesian analysis is that my prior as the analyst might not be the same as your prior as the reader. Um, so why not allow you to come in and interactively specify your own prior um, and see how the paper would update on the basis of having a different prior. So this changes both the, interaction, the uh, visualization here and then also uh, the text below describing the result. Okay. So part of the point here is that we need better ways to acknowledge specification uncertainty and have a conversation about it through the literature. I think this is also true when we start thinking about um, you know, communicating results of machine learning models and uh, artificial intelligence models. Um, I've really been thinking about this a lot in terms of scientific communication, but I think a lot of these same principles would apply in those areas as well, um, which is something I'd love to have conversations with uh, folks here about. Um, OK, but I, I like to end this talk usually uh, by going back to election data, because again, like I said, it's one of the things that I like. Um, this is the New York Times election needle. Uh, how many of you experienced the New York Times election needle? Uh, yeah. Uh, so the interesting thing about the New York Times election needle, so the, the way this is actually working is um, on, the, on the night of that election, as returns were coming in, they had a model that was updating every 30 seconds, uh, so not as frequently as the needle is moving. Um, to give a predictive distribution for the margin of the Republican minus Democrat uh, presidential vote. Um, and then in your browser, that was updating every 30 seconds. Um, meanwhile, this needle was vibrating uh, within the central 50% interval uh, of that predictive distribution for what the vote margin would be. So this is essentially a form of hops or hypothetical outcome plot. It's trying to use animation to show uncertainty. People did not like the New York Times election needle. Um, 
So my favorite one of these is down in the right hand corner here. Uh, the New York Times needle jitter is irresponsible design at best and unethical design at worst and you should stop looking at it. Um, I think that this is wrong. Um, so the interesting thing about the New York Times election needle is it made a lot of people anxious. Uh, but I think it made them anxious because they were uncertain about something that they cared about. And if you're uncertain about something that you care about, you probably should be anxious. Um, which really just brings me to the end of my talk. Uh, so I think that one of the things that we need to be doing both in uh, communicating results and in uh, interrogating them ourselves is presenting well calibrated uncertainty that can't be ignored in ways that people can actually uh, understand. Thank you. So we have time for maybe one or two questions while we switch speakers. So Rich, if you can make it into the... And we have the microphone back there, so yes. Um, thanks for the talk. Um, so does any of the uncertainty definitions that you presented deal with sort of complex output from machine learning models? Say, we're so much focused today with predictions and trying to do, you know, binary multi-class. But as we go towards content generation, planning, path planning, um, how do you expect these uncertainty definitions to change? Uh, I, I, I think that's a really good question. So. Um, I think in, in, in those cases, um, if you can generate distributions over those uh, complex outputs, then I think you can still think about them in a similar sort of way where you're, you could say, um, you know, what are uh, some representative um, elements of these distributions and then, you know, giving some set of those that might be interesting to people. Um, I think that, I, I think that that's, uh, a complex question in terms of the way that you would actually present it as well, but I think that if you're thinking generally about uncertainty, at least in the statistical sense, and not like the second half of my talk, um, in terms of uh, how you construct distributions that represent that uncertainty, then you can start thinking about how do I take those distributions and maybe reduce them down to representative elements and then present those to people. Hi, Matt. Uh, so this is really, really interesting. Uh, I was curious about the one bus away study that you talked about. Is the conclusion that we take from that that the product becomes more useful in terms of the design of it if it does give you this uncertainty? Or is it simply that the product remains not useful until you get to a certain level of certainty <laughs> before you can choose whether to get coffee or not? Right. Uh, I, th I think that's a, that's a really good question. So, uh, sure. I mean, if if the system, if the, if the precision of those uh, predictions was on the order of like a minute, then yeah, you probably don't need to show the uncertainty, right? Um, but I think the the way that I would turn that around is that's a really nice like hypothetical question um, to which we're never going to need the answer uh, because none of our systems are ever going to be that accurate. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, so like that, that, that's a really great question if it was the case that, uh, you know, if a bus is 20 minutes away from me, I know that it's definitely going to take exactly 20 minutes for it to get from where it is to where I am now. Um, but like traffic exists, right? Um, and so there's always going to be uncertainty in that prediction. And so it's always going to be useful for me in that context to have ways of presenting that uncertainty to people. Unless I've like misunderstood your question. Well, I guess the, the simple version of my question. Oh, sorry. Was, uh, the simple version of my question is: uh, Do people rely more on one bus away if it shows uncertainty, even though they make better decisions when they do use it? Do they use it more? Oh, okay, okay. So, sorry, I, I misunderstood your question. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I don't have a good answer to that um, because we've, we've done lab studies on it, but we haven't done deployment studies. Uh, so that, that's actually something we're kind of thinking about, like. Uh, you know, doing sort of experience sampling in the wild to try to answer questions like that. Uh, I think you also get really interesting um, questions that arise where, you know, if, if you know the uncertainty and the system has communicated it to you well and you could have made a better decision, um, are you now actually sadder because you can't blame the system for the mistake that you were going to make? Like, I can't send the email that says, oh, like, I missed my bus, but haha, one bus away is so terrible, so. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah. So I think there's there's interesting like complex questions that that start happening when you see how that works in the real world um, that I don't I don't have great answers to yet. Yeah. Let's thank our speaker one more time.
And I know we have some other hands le left behind. We're going to have a time for discussion, so save those questions. We'll, we'll get back to those in due time. But now it's time to hear from Rich Caruana. He's a senior principal researcher at Microsoft Research AI. has been working for almost a decade on explainability of systems, and he already was mentioned in prior talks, so I'll let him do the continuation. Rich. Thank you. Can you hear me? Great. Two really good presentations, so I wish I wasn't going third. Um, OK, so I'm going to jump in and talk about the risk of using black boxes and the advantages of using machine learning that you can understand. And I'm really going to be talking about sort of debugging data by looking at a model that's trained on that data. Uh, before I jump in, I just want to thank a bunch of people. I think at least two of these collaborators are here in the room. I think Johannes is over there. And I think Eric is back here. So, so at least uh, two of the collaborators are here. But this is many people, uh, grad students, people at hospitals, doctors who have helped us with this. Uh, a lot of collaborators over the last uh, seven or eight years. All right, so let's uh, jump right in. I'm going to tell you a story to begin with. Uh, back when I was a grad student at CMU, I was asked to train a neural net on a pneumonia risk problem. So imagine all of you have been diagnosed already with pneumonia, and our goal is to predict whether you're high risk or low risk. High risk, you absolutely need to be in the hospital, possibly the ICU. About 10% of people with pneumonia die from it, so it's serious. But if you're low risk, the best treatment really is as an outpatient, chicken soup, antibiotics, Calls in a few days if you're not feeling better. Hospital is a terrible place to be if you don't need to be there. It's risky, especially if you already have one infection. I guess I got lucky. The neural net that I trained in the mid-'90s was the most accurate model any of the many different teams working on this data set could train. So I sort of won the competition. And the question was, was it safe to use this neural net on real patients to do some sort of clinical trial? And I said, no. I think it's actually too risky to use this black box neural net, which has millions of weights in it that we don't understand, on real patients. And one of the reasons I was afraid of that was a friend who was doing rule-based learning at a different university learned the rule from the same data set that if you have a history of asthma, it lowers your chance of dying from pneumonia. That is, asthma is good for you if you've got pneumonia, OK? Um, so that doesn't sound right, right? So we asked the doctors, and the doctors said, oh, no, that's not true. Asthmatics are very high risk if they've got pneumonia. Uh, so you've got to fix your model so they don't predict that. And then they said, ah, you know, we kind of understand why that might be a pattern in the data, though. And the story they said was, you know, asthmatics pay a lot of attention to their breathing. Uh, they've got a med that they would try, an inhaler or something. They try it. It doesn't have the expected result. They're already plugged into healthcare. They've got a doctor who has prescribed their inhaler. They, they know who to call when things aren't, aren't feeling right. So they make a call. The doctor says that's weird. They get an appointment. Then the doctor realizes they've got pneumonia. They're considered very high risk, and they get very high quality care. So two very important things have happened there. One is they get to care rapidly, which if you've got an infection, there's nothing better than treating the infection quickly. And then when they get to care, it's taken very seriously because they're considered abnormally high risk. So they get incredibly high quality care once they get there. And those are the two things that make the asthmatics look like they're lower risk. It's not that they're intrinsically lower risk. They're actually intrinsically higher risk. But it's the quality and rapidity of the care that they get that makes them look like they're lower risk. Now, I just assume if a rule-based system learned this from the data because it's a real pattern in the data, then this thing is lurking in my neural net's million weights somewhere. You might think this is why I was afraid to use the neural net. Actually, it's not, because what I said back then was, you know, I'm a smart guy. I can probably figure out how to make this asthma problem go away in the neural net now that I know about it. And, you know, I'm a grad student. I'll get to publish more papers in the process of trying to do that. I said what really scares me is what else did the neural net learn that's similarly wrong and risky for patients, but something like a rule-based system that's intelligible didn't also learn this other thing and warn me that I have yet other problems lurking in the neural net that I need to fix. OK, so that's what really terrified me is the sort of unknown unknowns that might be lurking in the neural net. And I'll show you in a few slides that there were, in fact, other unknown unknowns that we didn't know about then, but we know about now. Before I go on, what's the basic problem here? Uh, Dan alluded to it in his presentation. It's basically statistical confounding. Right? So we have certain features in the data set, like whether you have asthma or not. And it turns out those are statistically confounding with some very important features that we don't have, things like time to care uh, and quality of care. Now, quality of care we probably could measure. Right? We, we could find out what treatment the patient received uh, if we have good medical records. Time to care is a little hard, and it's probably the most important single factor here. 
Uh, it's hard because we don't know when the patient came down with pneumonia in the first place, how rapidly pneumonia progressed in the patient. So, so even in principle, we probably can't get time to care. There are even worse problems. Like, we don't have genomic data yet for all of us. There's probably important variables in your genome that affect your chance of surviving from pneumonia. And we don't know them yet. And all of that information we don't know yet and probably won't have in your record for 20 years, that is already confounding on the variables that we do have in the data set. So there's confounding that we can't even solve because it would require future medical knowledge that, that's not developed yet. So confounding is not something you can just sort of wish away. You can't sort of decide, oh, if I really had collected the data better, all these issues would go away and the problem would be solved. So we're going to have to somehow live with the data the way it lies. You might also think, well, we just do a randomized clinical trial, right? That's the sort of gold standard for figuring out these sorts of things. So what would that mean? That would mean denying rapid, high-quality care to some asthmatics who have pneumonia to see if they live or die, right? right? So, so it's not ethical. We're not going to do that study. Um, so, uh, so you really have to learn to live with the data the way it is. And you've got to decide to make some progress using it. And what we're going to do is we're going to adopt intelligibility as our way of, of dealing with this. You might think you could clean the data. I won't have much time to talk about this, but it turns out that's actually much harder than trying to understand and clean the model. Okay. By the way, I won't have time to talk about this, this bias, this asthma bias that's in the data. It's exactly the same kind of bias that we have for race and gender bias and socioeconomic bias. So these very same techniques that we're going to use in healthcare today are also applicable for race and gender bias, stuff like that. Uh, if there's time, I can, can talk about that at the end. All right. So what would we need to solve this problem? A model as accurate as the neural net that we wanted to use but it's easy to understand as, say, logistic regression. That would be great. Unfortunately, there tends to be this trade-off where the really accurate models, you know, deep neural nets and random forest and boosted trees are not very intelligible. And the more intelligible models, things like logistic regression, linear regression, sadly on complex data sets are not very accurate. So we're looking for something up in this upper right-hand corner that's both accurate and intelligible. And to our surprise, we now have at least one algorithm that's sitting up there that works on many data sets. And it's called Generalized Additive Models with Pairwise Interaction. So I'm just going to tell you briefly about this model class, and then I'll show you what we see when we use it. OK. These are linear models. This is a weight times a feature plus a weight times a feature, right? Pretty easy to understand by looking at these weights and maybe the confidence intervals around those weights. This is a full complexity model. It's just an arbitrary function of all the features. So think of that as a deep neural net or a random forest. There are things in between. This is a function of a feature plus another function of a feature. These are functions, but functions of single features. OK, so they're not an arbitrary function of all the features. That's a function of one feature. This is a special case. This is a very simple function, just a weight times the feature. This can be much more complicated. It can be a multimodal, very nonlinear function of an individual feature. Turns out that's a very restricted model class. And what's nice about it is it's visualizable because we can plot these graphs. And you already saw one of these graphs in Dan's presentation. Now, we can make that a little more complicated. This is, all the, this is the sum of all functions of individual features. That's this. This is the sum of all functions over pairs of features. So this can now do pairwise interactions. Sum of all functions over three-way interactions of features. And we're going to restrict ourselves to just main effects, functions of individual features, and a small number of the most important pairwise interactions. And we're going to stick with that class of models because they remain interpretable to humans. Now, we didn't invent these. Generalized additive models were invented by our friends uh, Trevor Hasty and Rob Tipsharani at Stanford in the late 80s. So these have been around for a long, long time. They predate much of machine learning. The only thing that made them not sort of win, take over the world, was statisticians were very conservative when they fit these models. And because of that, they didn't get all the accuracy and intelligibility that we now know how to get out of them using sort of modern machine learning techniques. So our contribution is to really put these things on sort of modern steroids and, and make them have a performance that they never had before. So, so that's our contribution. But these guys are very smart, and they invented these, these methods, these generalized additive models, for exactly the reasons we want to use them today. So, so, so this is really great work. I'm going to skip all the technical details of how these things work. And instead, I'm going to jump in and show you what we can see from models that are trained using these things. <coughs> Happy, of course, if you're interested in what's under the hood to, to talk about that. 
This is this pneumonia data set collected in 1989. So this is a pretty old data set. Uh, these are the 46 features. And remember, the model class is a function of a feature plus a function of a feature. So there's going to be 46 functions of the 46 features. And then we're going to throw in 10 pairwise interactions. So there's going to be 56 functions total. And we have things like the age of the patient, whether they have asthma, cancer. Uh, we know their body temperature, their blood rate, what their breathing sounds like. We've done some blood tests. And all these patients have had an x-ray. Uh, so when a doctor is taking notes from the x-ray. So that's the kind of information we have for these patients. Uh, nowadays, we wouldn't have some of this information. We'd have other information. But, but this is a good representative set of medical information. This was a great data set back then. It's only about 15,000 patients. Back then, that was a huge data set. <laughs> uh, nowadays, that would, this would be a very modest data set. OK, so this is a function of the feature age. This is a function of the feature asthma, a function of the feature blood urea nitrogen. So each of these things is graphs, and I'll show you some of these in close up. So basically, what you do is you find the patient's age or, or your age. You read across the uh, x-axis. You read the y value. The y value is a number that's positive or negative. If it's positive, it adds to your risk, your chance of dying. And if it's negative, it lowers your risk. And if it's zero, you just have default risk. OK, so you want to be as negative as possible. And what you do is you, it's an additive model. So you just take a sum of all these numbers. So you take a sum and you get a score. And then you convert it, in this case, to a probability of death by just 1 over 1 plus e to the minus score. OK, so we might get a score of minus 0 0.78. That's not really good. You'd like to be a minus 3 or a minus 4. Uh, and this turns out to be a probability of death of 1 in 3, which is a very high probability of death for, for many conditions. OK, so that's the way the model works. Let's jump in. Remember, there's 56 of these graphs. I'm only going to show you two or three of them. Let's jump in and see one of these graphs. So I'm going to show you risk as a function of age first. OK. The bottom is just a histogram of our patients. You had to be an adult, so everybody's over 18. Most patients are between, say, 60 and 90. OK, so that, that's our density of patients. This is what the model has learned about your risk, chance of dying, as a function of age. And it's an additive model. It has learned all 56 graphs in parallel. That's very important that it is learning these things all together. This is not a marginalization plot. It's something more sophisticated than that. So and remember, down is good. So you want to be down here. Up is higher risk, adding to your risk. So let's interpret the graph. Well, let's see. It's, it's good to be young. Young seems to be anything under, what, about 50? And the model doesn't seem to distinguish between people in their 20s, 30s, and 40s, even though it could, because statistically, it just doesn't see enough evidence that people in their 30s or 40s are different from people in their 20s. So this is all equally low risk. Risk goes up sort of slowly as you go through your 50s into your 60s. Jump in risk at around 67, 68. Turns out that's retirement. Risk goes up pretty rapidly as you go through your 70s into your 80s. I think that's to be expected. Surprising rise in risk right at 85. It's a very interesting round number to see a rise in risk. Surprising flatness in risk actually throughout the late 80s and 90s. That's interesting. And then a really, really surprising drop in risk happening right at 100, 101. OK, so, so, let's, so, so let, let, let's talk about those things. Um, so remember, this is how the model has learned your risk uh, changes with your age, independent of all the other factors it's all, also learned about. OK, so to get a person's final risk, we have to look at all 56 graphs. This is just one of them. Um, this is retirement. You might have thought retirement was good for you. Uh, apparently not if you have pneumonia. Uh, there are lots of reasons why your risk might go up if you retire. It could be your daily activity has changed. Your rush to get health care might have changed. Your provider might have changed. Your insurance might have changed. You may have moved and not even have a new doctor yet where you've moved to. Who, who knows? Somehow, in the aggregate, all these changes that happen around retirement actually seem to lower your chance of getting high quality care if you're coming down with something like pneumonia, which of course can masquerade as a cold or a flu for a long period of time. So, so it turns out retirement's not necessarily good for you for everything. Um, this rise in risk, that's to be expected. This rise in risk at 85, that's really weird. It's a very round number. Um, we're pretty sure, uh, this is data from 1989. Okay, so, so back in the 80s, being over 85 was really very old, right? Not that many people lived to their upper 80s and into their 90s, okay? So we think what's happening here is there's nothing in uh, insurance policy or healthcare policy that says to treat an 86-year-old differently than an 84-year-old. 
But we think what's happening is we're being a little less aggressive for the very elderly patients, as in, you know, grandpa's 86 years old, has a number of comorbidities, other illnesses associated with being elderly. Now, because of those illnesses, probably grandpa's got pneumonia. Maybe we're not doing grandpa any favors by going for a third round of antibiotics. Maybe, maybe we should let grandpa pass. Okay, and that was considered perhaps a friendlier way. Uh, and and in back then, pneumonia was actually called the old man's best friend. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, you know, sort of suggesting that uh, that that in fact maybe this was a nice thing for very elderly patients who were nearing the end of days anyway. So we think what we're seeing in the graph is basically just a sort of less aggressive treatment and vigilance for patients who are over this very round number which back then would have been sort of the, the threshold of being very elderly as opposed to not quite so elderly. So that's our best explanation for that jump. This flatness we think might be what's called successful agers, people who have pretty good genes and have made it this far. Uh, so, so people have taken care of themselves. So, so maybe a person who's 95 and has gotten this far really isn't at higher risk than somebody who's 90 at dying from pneumonia uh, if they get appropriate treatment. This drop at 100, 101, that's the, the killer. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, bad choice of words. Um, that's the surprise. And we think, again, right, 100's a really round number, and it has a lot of meaning to humans, right, because we do things base 10. Like 100 is a centenarian. It's a really exceptional thing, especially in 89. This is an extremely exceptional age. Uh, we, we see more centenarians now than we used to, but back then this was a very unusual thing. And we think what's happening is it's just like this social effect at 85, but now going the other direction, as in, you know, you've made it to 100. It's pneumonia. It's a completely treatable illness, right? right? We are just not going to let pneumonia be the thing that takes you out, right? We're, we're just going to go for it. We're going to go for the record. You're going to get that third or fourth round of antibiotics if that's what we have to do. We're, we're just going to go for it. And this is not going to be the thing that, that ends you. And we think what we're seeing is increased vigilance sort of happening once people get over this magic threshold of, a, of 100. And we're seeing that, that improvement in their health care. All right, interesting things about this model. It turns out, remember, the model has 56 graphs. This model is just as accurate as the neural net. In fact, it's a little more accurate than the neural net. It's the most accurate model we can train in the data. And yet, we can look at the graphs, and we can try to sort of understand the nuances of what it's learned. Now, remember, it's us doing this detective work. It's not that the model has figured out you know, that 100 means centenarian, that 85 meant very elderly. It, the model doesn't know any of this. This is just what the model has learned. And now we're trying to understand what the model has learned and see if it makes sense. So now, question, how many people think that a person who's 105 is actually lower risk than a person who's 95, which is what the model's telling us, right? And I don't think intrinsically we believe that's the case although we could believe that's the case after care is applied. So one of the things we can do, because the model is a series of graphs, is we can have experts, doctors, edit this graph, and then the model will do our bidding. Okay, so we can actually just modify this, this model, and now it will not predict that people who are under five are lower risk than people who are 95. So that, that's great. By the way, when we do that, accuracy on the test set goes down a little, and that's because the test set looks just like the training set. And the model is actually rewarded for predicting that people who are under five are lower risk, even though we don't think that's true clinically, and that if we were to use predictions that said 105-year-olds were lower risk, we might actually injure some patients. So, so when we make this correction, our laboratory accuracy goes down, even though we believe the model will do better in the real world, be more appropriate. This thing at 85, I'm willing to leave it in the model. Our explanation for why it's probably there is that we think patients over 85 are getting less aggressive treatment than they might benefit from. So if the model predicts they're higher risk, maybe that would cause them to get more aggressive treatment. So we're actually happy to leave that in and just warn doctors and patients about this and say, you might want to stop being less vigilant over 85 because we're seeing a sign that that's reducing pe people's uh, chance of survival. And then this retirement effect, what we'd love to do is just next time we collect the data, add a new variable for retirement. And then the retirement effect will move on to that graph. And then we'll be left without this bump here in the age graph. Remember, this is a correlated graph. Uh, age is correlated with retirement. So that'll move to the retirement variable. And now we'll have more of the intrinsic risk associated with age minus the retirement effect if, if we do that. So, so that's great. Do we always want to make these edits? 
Suppose we're an insurance company and our interest is not in intervening in a patient's care, but our interest is actually in just knowing whether a patient's gonna live or not so we know how much money to keep in the bank and charge for their health care. It turns out the model's already pretty good from an actuarial point of view. So we don't necessarily need to edit. That's important because it means whether a model is right or wrong or data is appropriate or inappropriate completely depends on what the model will be used for, what the predictions will be used for. Okay, so you can't define right or wrong until you define how the model's predictions will be used. And that can be pretty challenging actually, so won't have time to talk about that. Let me show you a few things the model learned and then we'll wrap up. Jumps that happen around numbers are all over in the graphs. They're almost always because of social human policy effects. There are very few phase changes in, in science and biology and physics. Of course, it learns that asthma lowers risk. We expect that it's a real pattern in the data. But with this sort of very accurate model, we can see that. And then we can go in and we can repair that graph. We can make the asthma effect go away easily in this model, even though we couldn't do it in the neural net. Here's two fun things it learned. It learns that heart disease and chest pain are also good for you if you've got pneumonia. OK, so, so in, in fact, the best thing for you would be to be 105 years old with a history of asthma, chest pain, and heart disease. That would be a, a, a great low risk patient. So why does it learn this? It's exactly like the asthma effect. It's confounding. If you've had heart disease, Maybe you had a heart attack a few years ago or you're worried about a heart attack. You wake up with early symptoms of pneumonia. You think you might be having a heart attack. You're in the ER in an hour, right? You're, you're there immediately. Even at the hospital, you get to the front of the line. They put probes on you and they quickly realize you're not having a heart attack. And then later in the day, they diagnose that you've got pneumonia. You have heart disease, so they consider you to be a very high risk patient. So you get incredibly high quality care. In fact, it's better to be a heart disease patient than an asthmatic because they get to care even faster than the asthmatics. Okay, so. Um, now the model is rewarded for predicting all of these things. You know, 105 year old asthmatic with heart disease is low risk. It's rewarded for that with like superhuman accuracy on the test set, but that's because it's doing things humans would never do. It's only superhuman in the sense that it's willing to do things that no human who knows anything would do. So you gotta be careful. Laboratory accuracy is often misleading in this way. And I can show you a number of examples where deep neural nets trained on clinical images also do things that are very silly and non-human. And if you were to remove those effects, their accuracy no longer looks quite as wonderful as it does. Good thing we didn't deploy the neural net back in the mid 90s. Our fear was justified. There are other things lurking probably in the neural net that we wouldn't have known about and we wouldn't have known to fix. Uh, you might think, by the way, a way to fix this is to remove a feature like heart disease or asthma from the input of the model. How can it predict your lower risk if you have asthma, if it doesn't know you have asthma? Turns out there's correlation between the features that are going in the model uh, with things that you might remove from the model. And the bias is all coming from the outputs, from the target signals, from the training signals, not from the input features. So it'll learn to be just as biased as it can be. It'll get its heart disease asthma fix through the other correlated features. So in fact, now what we do is variables like race and gender, where we might be worried about bias in the model, we make sure those are inputs to the model. We allow the model to become as biased as it possibly can be, because that's telling us what's in the data. And then we can see the bias, and then because it's an interpretable model with graphs, we can edit the bias and repair it. Okay, I'm gonna stop there. There are lots of, I just wanna, let me do this one graph. Um, this is blood urea nitrogen. Risk goes up as your bun goes up. All of you have had a bun test. It's a standard, standard to say when you get blood drawn. The doctor said, you know, this is really fascinating, and I thought it was kind of boring because it just says that more of something is bad for you, which is very common. Uh, the doctor said what's interesting is they were all taught that 50 was the level at which patients were high enough risk that they should treat them. And they said, what's fascinating is your graph says the risk is already very high at 40, and maybe we should be treating at a lower Bund level. Uh, and they all looked at each other and they said, I don't know, I learned 50 in, in med school, where'd you learn 50? They all learned at the same place. It's a round number, right? Doctors use round numbers just like everybody else does. Okay, I'm just gonna stop. And uh, uh, this is just an example of most of the things that the model learns, 90, 95% of what it learns is actually wonderful stuff. It's correct and you're not gonna wanna edit it. But there is sort of five to 10% that's happening in these models because it's in your data. Uh, and that stuff really needs to be detected and corrected. And I guarantee you every data set you've ever used has problems like this lurking in it. Uh, and once you have the sort of magic pair of glasses, 
uh, all of a sudden you see these things and you can fix them. So. Uh, by the way, we've released open source code for this, so uh, you can all train these kind of models now very efficiently if, if you're interested. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. <laughs> so we're going to transition right away to the panel where you'll have time to ask your question. But we'll, we'll, let's invite the speakers to sit on the, uh, on the, I don't know how to call that, the, uh, the, the, the amphitheater of, yeah. of panic or the, uh, the line I of fame or... Just give us a minute to arrange it. If someone has a question for Rich, let's ask it now. Yeah. OK, yep. so very interesting. The data is uh, eight, 1989. So do you ha have you collected new data? It's a wonderful question. We have not collected new data specifically no, no. for pneumonia. And there is no doubt, when I look at related problems to pneumonia, like all cause 30 day readmission, things like that. We do see that some of these patterns still are true in modern data and other patterns completely disappear. Yeah, so, so, so in fact, the 100 effect tends to be less true of modern data because we no longer consider 100 to be a magically, a magically old patient. Like 95 is the new 85. Yeah, so. very good. And uh, also uh, related to the question is uh, explainable models. Uh, more applicable to the new data? I mean, in the new cases or not, right? The explainable model works very well with the new data. Uh, one thing I want to be careful of is this model works on what Dan Weld was calling, you know, semantic data, data where the features have meaning to you. If this was pixels, then this is not an appropriate model class for pixels. And this isn't going to compete with deep learning and convolutional nets on, on pixels and things like that. But for any data set where the features have meaning to you, then this is a very appropriate model. And it competes neck and neck with boosted trees and random forests and, and simple neural nets. So it's, uh, it's surprising that you can have your cake and eat it too in this case, where you can get accuracy and intelligibility uh, almost for free. Yeah. Thank you. Let's have Rich seat, and uh, this is a very quick experiment. Uh, remember Ken Hinckley and I working on proxemics. This is, this is proxemics in action. <laughs> um, yes, sir. Uh, hi, I'm Peter Brzezlowski. A question to Daniel, although it probably relates to everyone else. Uh, at IUI conference, there was a lot of talk this year on this intelligibility and explanation, and it turns out that it's hard to deal with neural networks approaches, which is really hard to explain in any ways. And several suggestions were using examples showing people what these neural models can and cannot learn. Um, and examples are actually not in your playbook. On the other hand, if you look at the two other speakers, they really operate with examples. If you show visualization, they show examples of cedar uh, feeling, in, which is a kind of example from the human past. And the second, again, appealing to people understanding by showing examples of what could be learned wrong from pneumonia. So what are the role of examples and using them for explanations in your playbook. Um, I, think that's, I think that's a great question. I think examples are really helpful. And so um, I think there's a good question about what the examples should be. And there's a number of methods, for example, of choosing out exemplars from the training set, uh, influence functions, and so on, are one way of choosing, choosing that in a domain-independent way. There's also ways you can do that in a model-specific way. But I think that's a good, good technique. The, there is work on explaining complex models like neural nets by doing case-based explanation, essentially. You're, you're finding the examples in the training set that mo look most like the test point, and then showing them to the expert or the physician, and asking them to then sort of understand. <coughs> and you're using the model as a distance function. So you're using what the model has learned. Uh, and you're basically asking the user to say, well, the model thinks these 10 patients are very much like this patient has just made a prediction for, and, and you're asking the user to then understand the similarity between them. Sorry. Uh, that's a version of this. There are, there are multiple versions of this. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's a thing called case-based explanation from the late 90s. There's also some modern work in prototype selection, um, prototype networks. There, there's a number, of, a number of variations on this theme. The, the common thing between many of them is you use the learned model as a distance function so that you can do an informed selection of the nearest cases to any test point. Yeah. But that storage. Yes, yes. You, you need to have, if it's, if it's going to be a case-based like system, then it has to have access to the, to the set of cases. It's one of the advantages of prototype-based methods is that they would typically store a much smaller number of prototypes than all of the original data. 
Yes. Uh, I think I. Um, Um, so uh, I preface this by saying that this is not my area, and I haven't been following it for decades. But uh, the uh, the notion somebody talked about earlier. Could you say more about that notions of back in the 80s? I remember that uh, AI was mostly about expert systems, and uh, neural networks was was this new thing that was not AI. Now AI is, from what I can tell, is basically neural networks. And um, so the the question is. Um, is there a hybrid that would I can I can remember actually talking to experts to elicit models from them back in the 80s? Is there a hybrid model that would allow us to sort of model experts to establish what the the, the hidden layer should be about, uh, assuming that neural networks can you know may, maybe there are several different ways of coming to equally good solutions? Why not seed it with the one that's most likely to yield um, intelligibility later? And you could say more about that. Um, well, I think there's a number, number of different ways of addressing that question, but I think it's a, it's a good idea. It's hard to do. Certainly a key area in AI is trying to integrate symbolic um, and, and neural methods, and that's going to hopefully give a more robustness as well as, um, as some of this interpretability. Uh, another thing you can imagine doing is could you learn something like one of um, the GAM models that, that Rich talked about over neural, neurally learned features? Um, I think there's a bunch of things that one could try to do. Active area. And to add to that, um, so we're doing some work in trying to learn a GAM in parallel with a neural net. So the neural net will learn only the stuff that the GAM couldn't learn. And also, as you're suggesting, trying to bias the neural net towards representations that are more, and there's other work on biasing neural nets towards representations that might be more, less distributed and more local, as Dan mentioned in his talk. So th there is work on, on doing that. And then we view the GAMs and a human looking at them and possibly editing them. Like, we think it's easier for experts not to tell you everything they know but it's easier for es experts to look at something and say, oh, that looks right, that looks right, that looks right, oh, that's weird. Um, and this one's just dead wrong, we need to fix it. So, so we think uh, this is one way of eliciting expertise efficiently from experts is by actually showing them something and then having them say what they agree with and disagree with. But there, there's lots of, as Dan said, there's lots of different approaches to these sorts of things. It's not a solved problem, though. I don't want to make it seem like, you know, we're, we've been there and we've done it already. Yeah. So, First, I want to thank all the speakers. There's super interesting stuff cutting across all this. The, the one thing about which I want to ask is cases where right and wrong are not necessarily obvious. So a lot of the things you describe, like when the bus shows up or does the person die from pneumonia, like there is a yes or no answer. It's clear cut. Um, if you look at instances, things like uh, toxicity detection in online discussion, there's a lot more room for interpretability. And I'm wondering how the, the methods that each of you described, how you might think about applying it to those kinds of problems where there might not be an agreement or there might not be a definitive ground truth for every single data point. Um. Yeah, uh, so I think I think that's a great question. I think uh, those sorts of questions have been a lot of the motivation for for me for thinking about this notion of ontological uncertainty and, and multiverse analysis. Right, um, when you start getting into complex social questions where we don't have clear answers, we don't our your your output uh, the thing you're trying to predict, you don't even necessarily know what the right definition of that thing is. Um, that's a, a really good case for saying, well, we can come up with a, a space of possible definitions of this thing um, and look at that space and try to understand, uh, you know, yeah, it, it, is, it, are the predictions that we make, the things that we learn, are they actually sensitive to those different possible definitions or um, are there a set of definitions that if you look at them and say, uh, I mean, I don't know much about toxicity, but maybe you put experts in front of them and they say, well, these particular set of definitions all give us similar results, and if we think about the domain expertise that goes into trying to define toxicity, maybe there's something about those definitions that makes sense, right? Um, 
so so I, I think it is, it's this point where you have to have the interaction between the domain expertise and the models that you're building to try to understand that. And it's, it's hard to just kind of sweep it under the carpet. Oh, well, actually, it's easy to sweep it under the carpet, but I think it's a bad idea. <laughs> Um, yeah, I would just add that that seems to come up absolutely all the time. So I think it's a super important problem. Um, uh, you see people trying to take these subjective decisions and make them crisper and crisper. So, uh, for example, in the natural language processing guidelines for co-reference, you know, whether one uh, phrase is referring to the same thing as another phrase, it's like 30 pages long. Um, because there's always these ambiguous cases. Um, Chris Welty has a wonderful paper uh, that came out in AI Magazine um, uh, a few years ago called Truth is a Lie, um, which it gets at this notion of um, there not being subjective decisions in many, in many, many cases. Uh, just briefly, uh, most modern learning methods are fairly good at handling uncertainty and probabilistic information. So if we can cast it as a probabilistic problem, then we'll do okay and, and we can make sure that they're calibrated and things like that. The other thing is a lot of learning methods can also do regression. So instead of doing black, white, Boolean probabilistic prediction, we also, if we had a scale, we might be able to predict things along a scale as well. And that would allow us to soften some of these things for which we have less black, white, black and white answers. We have time for a couple of more questions. We have one on the back and then one on the front. Well, first of all, thank you for the very interesting presentations to all of you. I believe most of the work you presented uh, deals with offline learning, where we have some data and you try to extract some knowledge from the data. Now, would anything from what you presented uh, have implications, or would there be any parallels with uh, real-time learning, where you don't have any data to start with, and you're trying to d d uh, learn the optimal decisions? from the data as you acquire it? For instance, as, is, as in autonomous driving. Uh, can you comment on that, please? Thank you. Uh, so we can imagine GAM learning being modified for the online setting, although we haven't focused on that very much yet. Uh, so there's nothing in principle that would make it not work. And then you would see graphs. I, I really like the uh, multiverse kind of, kind of plots. You can imagine that you'd be watching the graphs sort of percolate o over time, and you could maybe replay the last month of uh, modifications to the online learning system you know, quickly and see if there's been phase changes in the real world concept drift and stuff like that. So there's nothing in principle that would prevent us from doing it. But there's nothing magic about the methods, at least that, that I talked about, uh, that make them more suitable for online settings than other things. So. Yep, I would say the same issues uh, I think think apply because we're, we're regardless of where you're getting the training data. You still have to choose a model class. You should still hopefully choose uh, an interpretable one if you can. And if you can't, if you're going to explain it, you're going to have to use some sort of approximations. There, there is one weird thing in GANs. Because they're additive individual <coughs> components, you can do something weird like the model starts to learn something on one of the graphs that you actually believe is inappropriate and you think is because of some change that's happened in the world. And you can decide, no, we're going to keep using the old graph for this feature while we allow it to keep updating the other features. And that actually works pretty well. So there, there is a little extra like controls that you have in these additive models because of their simplicity that you wouldn't have in a neural net. I don't know how to tell a neural net keep doing exactly what you were doing for this feature, but otherwise keep learning and updating on all the other features, because I'm happy with the new stuff. Uh, yeah, but we can do things like that with, with simpler models like GAMS. Hi, yeah, uh, just amazing talks, um, all of you. Um, I just had a question about uh, communicating the sources of uncertainty. So you said, you know, there's a limit to how well you can be sure the bus is going to show up. There's traffic, there's all sorts of other things. Yeah. Um, so is there um, a, a systematic way that people have talked about allowing experts to essentially um, communicate uh, potent their hypotheses about sources of uncertainty and the limits of knowability that you know we might pursue. It also, in the, the kinds of context you were talking about, the reasons why retire retirement. You know, you, you wove a narrative uh, through this, which you know after the investigation, and then that becomes a really powerful communications mechanism. Um, is that our new kind of expert elicitation system? How can mm. we communicate those things? Yeah. So. Uh, uh... I guess there's a there's a couple of uh, things. So there there is a 
uh, sort of long literature on things like expert prior elicitation. Um, there's, a, there's a nice kind of book by O'Hagan called, I think it's called Uncertain Judgments or something like that, um, which uh, tries to summarize a, a chunk of that literature, which, which is a good place to look at. I think the other thing is that there, there are recommendations for how to do qualitative uncertainty communication. Um, you know, ask, asking experts how good they think their models are in a particular um, area. So, so the uh, IPCC, the whatever the intergovernmental governmental panel on climate change, for example, they encounter exactly these sorts of issues. Like, we have these complex models we're trying to communicate uh, for climate prediction. Um, the experts are assessing how good they think those models are, how well they think they're agreeing. Um, and then they have sort of scales for, for trying to accumulate that and then turn it into usually like a qualitative statement of uh, confidence in the model. So, so I think what's fun is there's a new kind of uncertainty here, which is an uncertainty in the explanation. And it has at least two components. One component is just the fidelity of the explanation to whatever you're explaining. In GAMS, there's no fidelity problem because the model is the model. What you see is exactly what it is. But there's this new kind of uncertainty, which is how much do you trust your explanation for why the model is doing that? Because that has a big effect on whether you decide to edit the model or not, right? If, if you, so, so that jump we see at 85, I mean, all the patients were from 1989. Maybe there was something in the influenza epidemic of 1918 which caused that sudden rise in risk. And it's absolutely true for those patients, but only for that year. And in fact, it has nothing to do with my you know, round numbers, people over 85 or extra old kind of analysis. So whenever we make this sort of interpretation, that's all on us to be detectives. And I, I tell you, when I show these graphs to doctors, you, you know, they're very smart people. And they'll come up with you know, half a dozen explanations for every funny thing we see in a graph. Um, yeah, yeah. So it's up, it's up to us to track down that uncertainty in the explanation. And because then we're going to decide whether to act on it and correct the model or not, which is if you're correcting a model, you're overruling the data. That's something you have to take very, very seriously. Um, and just elaborating on that, I think if you're generating um, an explanation using one of these approximation techniques, then you've got that problem in spades. So if you get a nonsensical answer explanation out, then there's a very real question. Is that because uh, the explanation system gave, you know, did a terrible job? Um, because uh, it's an AI system too, right? Or is it because the explanation system gave a very good answer and the underlying model is wacko? And, so. and that's where I think Dan talked about, you know, explanation should be a dialogue as opposed to a, a single output. And I, I suspect that that would help a lot with, with that kind of uncertainty. Yeah, I, I really like that you made that point because the, I think when you start getting into some of those more complex notions of uncertainty, um, where you want to incorporate domain expertise or, or these sort of qualitative judgments, it's hard to just say, I'm going to give you an output and then deal with it, right? Like having that actual conversation with the system, I think, is important. So uh, I guess this is, the, this is it. Uh, this is all the time we got, even more than so. I am the only thing holding you from lunch. <laughs> but let's thank our fabulous speakers. And